There's some more Porsches next door. Come on, come on. Come on, in you come. <laughs> look at your face. What's wrong with you? So disinterested. Look at these, look. Uh, these two yeah. 50th anniversary two 50th, 991s. Yeah. Yeah. Look two at the seats, Jim, look at the 50th seats. 50th failed Beautiful. marriage cars. <laughs> Coming this way, Yes. Uh, this is actually the car I wanted to talk about, even though it's a 968. It's nice reminiscent eight. of the 928, yes. which, which takes us back to the South American special. Oh, okay? yes. Now, you, you write for a living, you're a wordsmith. Can you, and you were, were you involved in some of the preparation for the Argentina shoot? I was, yeah. Because I found that episode, it, I was, I'd left Top Gear at this point. Yeah, yeah. Same here. You, you had left, also left, I and left. As, a, as a fan, and we're watching the show, that yeah. all seemed to be quite a coincidence with the whole license plate. Yeah, it was. And, and people you, always go, do you buy that? No comment, Your Honour. Well, because, first of all, Jeremy wanted a 928. Uh, it wasn't a club sport, was it? What was the one he wanted? A GT. Very rare variant. And I remember him going... And they only came in Falklands. They only <laughs> came, came in, in Falklands in 1982. <laughs> well, the thing, there were plates. two of them for sale. Because the thing was, this, the whole premise of the film was that it was a goodbye to the V8 engine. So each presenter of the brief was, pick a car with a V8. And then, and he went, yeah, I want a 928. And he went, no, wait, I want a 928 GT. Because that, that was my favourite version of the 928. And so one of our researchers, who's still a friend of ours, went online and she found two for sale. That was all that was out there. So she called both numbers yeah. and both adverts yeah. and only one of them replied. And it was the other car. ones had Vietnam written on them. Yeah. One, had, <laughs> one had the Falklands. Or well, because the thing was, there was, we were discussing in the office, you know, shenanigans and whether it was like, oh, do we do some slogans and things like that? And then as was customary, someone from the team or two people from the team went out there on a recce and came back and went, guys, it would be really bad to do shenanigans because feelings are still running very high out there. And I remember talking to Jeremy about it and I went, so you're happy we don't do any shenanigans? He was like, we can't, we can't, we just can't, we can't. Like, I think he'd had it impressed on him how dangerous it was out there if yeah. he mucked around. So the car, because we went back and looked at the ad, the plates were blanked out in the ad, the car was inspected by a Porsche mechanic. He went, yeah, it's good, at the seller's house. And then it was stuck on a truck into a crate across the Atlantic because otherwise it wouldn't be there in time. So no one saw it? No one from there. the production saw it. And even when they did, they kind of went, oh, it's a nice car, that. And it wasn't until someone online went, oh, look, Top Gear in town, and they've got this comedy plate on the car. But that had been on the car since it was registered new in whenever it was, 91. So we would have had to track that car down. And then, luckily, it was for sale which of course is impossible, because how would you... Or we'd have had to retro-engineer it, gone, oh, look, there's a car for sale with an inflammatory Argentinian number plate. Let's go to Argentina with it, which would have been a really cock way of doing things. It looks suspicious, didn't it? I could because see why people thought it was suspicious, extra because exactly the sort the of nonsense as well. that we would do. Yeah. Well, they were retroactively brought over by a member of production who went later, because it was like, right, we've got a problem here, what do we do? Have some dummy plates made up and we can put those over the thing, but by the time they got out there, it was too late. So I listened to the interview with the police, the local policeman, and he was saying, you know, I can't remember what he was saying, but he was obviously pissed off. And then he got, they'd seized the car at this point and pulled yeah. out the license plates that were in there. Yeah. And it was B-E-L-L-E-N-D. Yeah. And he said, What's and we don't saying? think this is referring to the shape of a bell. <laughs> <laughs> so there was this extra set of plates, which made it look even yeah, worse. Yeah, because we were like, OK, well, let's just do a scene where, like, I mean, obviously, this doesn't check out from a story point of view. It's like somehow Hammond and May have found a place that makes British number plates in Argentina. But this was the, the way we were going to sort of try and smooth it over for the rest of the trip, was get some plates made up. Someone from production was going out halfway through the shoot. Take these with you, and then we can just claim one night James and Richard prank Jeremy by putting some plates that say Belland on his car. He's flawless, isn't he? It's just it's the truth. To be the thing is, he could well, easily get a job I've, at the CIA. I've been, I've I believe, been justifying I believe it. this for ages, and I always go, I can see why people would think it was, it was done deliberately, because it's exactly the sort of stupid shit we would have yeah. done. But on the other hand, it was far too subtle. We weren't that clever. You are that clever. I'm not. You and Clarkson together. <laughs> Dangerous. Yes. All right, like I think this. it's a good... I, mean, I feel anyway. like I'm watching... Is that it? Oh, it's a good pass. Sweaty I thought you didn't, like didn't, you didn't, you didn't stutter once. Yeah. I believe your story. All right, we'll go back in and look at some other stuff then. There you um, go. That's a nice, that's a nice that's one. Good, Even yeah. if it is purple. Silk cut purple is good. Future classic. Mm. I, now I must press you for some more FAQs, please. <laughs> Frequently asked questions. Yeah. Um, all right, so here we go. So biggest waste of money 
on Top Gear show. <laughs> Don't say you, Ben. <laughs> Apart from... You were great value. Yeah. Uh, well, you'd have to say the pilot set was a good start. Oh, yeah. Because that was massive. So we had, did this pilot oh, the episode original when, when, the, when yeah. the, the man dressed the as the robot stick came out. Mm. That was a huge thing. And then they went, no, it doesn't work. So it's scrapped. So, so it's scrapped, but yeah. I, that would have cost... Because I remember the set designer came in and sat down and, and with Wilman and he was going, so yeah, I've, I, I see what you mean. It's not really working. So I've had some thoughts. What I'm going to do is I think I can reconfigure this, reconfigure this. And Wilman went, no, I want you to take it outside and burn it. <laughs> And, uh, and that was it. And so then yeah, we did another done. pilot with no set whatsoever. Yeah. Just an empty room with some cars in it, which was too much. And then we'd Something run out of in between. time. Yeah. No, and money. So that's yes. why it's that really <laughs> shit with track. Do you remember that on the old studio, there was like track with a, with a, with a point, with a, with oh, a yes. really bad, like a 12 year old. Yeah. yeah. I think it has been done by a local mm. primary school. Also, another good waste of money in that it was just an idea that didn't work. Very first series, we had to, we suddenly went oh wait a minute if it rains some weeks that's not fair <laughs> yeah. on yes. cars that lap then or yes. celebrities that lap then so the answer is to level the playing field make yeah. sure the track it's is always wet, wet. Yeah. basically we've got this local water tanker who'd just done the drains or like from from the council and then they very quickly he turned up and was like well i won't be able to do the whole track I said, like, oh, do you, <laughs> what I'll tell you what, you do? why don't you do well, the you just corner? do the racing no, line. No, no, so what they did was they did the corners. Yeah. I was like, well, do the corners. So we did the corners. And then there was just literally foul. There was just shit everywhere. But the come out, because he'd done someone's drains or he was a council guy. The first dig, Perry, who was very good, he, was he went good. out in, in the Zonda to do a lap. It was an early programme, and he, all the, and of course it was really hot, so he did a dry line within about three laps. Yeah. Yeah. So it was completely pointless. So we never referred to it on the show. No. But, the, but the, the, um, the Zonda was covered in this crap. And I remember, <laughs> I remember me and the other researcher, Roland, had to go and clean it. And so we went to clean it. So we got buckets out with sponges. And the guy who brought it, who was like the UK, got wind of this and came up. And, Stop it! And like was having a go at us, and me and Ron like, he's getting his car cleaned for free. What was it? It's covered in human yeah. feces. So we got, we got, we got yeah. sponges with stones in. Just yeah. I don't yeah. know what his problem. Like a five-year-old. Yeah. I'll, I'll help. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah, if you watch that first, it's probably in the first episode, isn't it? Which is on yeah. iPlayer again. They've put them all on iPlayer. Yeah. And that first episode, I think, is the Pagani goes around. Yeah, the Pagani go around. And if you look closely, you can see these yeah. sort of dry of patches of human yeah. feces yeah. on exactly. the corners. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. So the space shuttle. Do you remember that? Yes. So I got told that that yeah. was, uh, it's one of, was my favourite yes. segment. And they, yeah. you know, you had a Robin, yeah. Reliant Robin yeah. with wings. Yeah. 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 And so when we watched it, it went up and then it crashed into yeah. the ground. Yeah. <clears throat> but it was meant to separate. And I was yeah. told that mm. actually, the only thing that failed on that was the separation. Yeah. Yeah, and so in it fact, was like bolt, wasn't it? It was yeah, if it had bolt, come off, it? this this was designed to, to fly two laps of the. Airfield. It was go it was going to glide, I think, because yeah. we'd experimented with. So it didn't have propulsion. Before. <laughs> yeah. It didn't have propulsion. Oh, God, fly oh, flying cars, one of the worst. There's a waste of money. Yeah, that was a waste of Trying money. Trying to make a flying car. Oh, very yeah. difficult. Worked but the with. wings were made of polystyrene, which I know I wasn't sure so that they would have stayed on. Oh, the shuttle wing. No, the shuttle one. What I'll say on the shuttle is, what a moment. A, B. I'd worked with these guys, these rocketeers, they were called, on the mini down the ski slope. Yep. Uh, and yeah. they were brilliant. And what they managed to achieve was extraordinary. Was and they were really, really good. And the so, largest rocket launch yes, on British soil or on something, British wasn't soil. it? Yeah, it was, pretty... was the shuttle. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. obviously, as you'll know, the Reliant Robin fiberglass, mm. no engine, no innards in it, so mm. very light. I think it would have worked because these guys were... They were from Manchester or somewhere. Right? Yeah, yeah, Gloucester. I, I, I stood with them with the mini, at the top of the ski jump. The whole crew, we were waiting for this thing to go off. So they'd loaded up the, a, an old school mini, and yeah. there was, as far as I could see, about sort of ten rockets in the back of it, mm. using is it rubber? Yes, yeah, it was it, rubber as yeah. the fuel. Yeah. And um, I, at the top of the sort of giant, you know, ski, it was a skiing jump. Mm -hmm. So you, when you, but when you look actually at the top and you look down, mm. you, you barely even see the landing slope, which yeah. is huge itself. And at the bottom there is a vast collecting area which mm. is which flattens out mm. but from the top it looks the size of a beer mat mm. and then it's just mountain and you could see an entire village of whole people all these lights on all these human beings that sort of lived below and i looked <laughs> down the barrel of this jump again and looked at the beer mat and the village i said but what if it takes off off 
and it could go past that. He said, well, we don't think that it will. <laughs> and then, sure enough, it lit up, and it went down. It was perfect, and it made the sound of the Millennium Falcon as it took yeah. off. Yeah. It was yeah. amazing. There were some items as well that never even made air because they were so shit. Oh, do you remember the bus? <laughs> yes, yeah. the unfunny yeah, bus. The unfunny bus. We had a, we had a bus. So we, the whole concept was The like, double-decker we used to Yeah, it was the double-decker that we, uh, we have to move well, it out of the studio each week. Right. Yeah, so there was a route master. Do you remember when route, they yeah, yeah, sold yeah. off the old route yeah. masters? And they, so they were, uh, I can't remember, yeah, five grand or yeah. ten grand? So the premise was, like a Heineken ad, what if Top Gear did a bus, right? And it just didn't play very well. It just... It was but we, we were lumbered with the very bus. Bad. Yeah, so we bought, that's it, we bought, a, 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 at some expense, bought a route master because yeah. we went, oh, they're selling route masters, let's buy one. And yeah. It, yeah, it was. Yeah. It was Top Gear doesn't do t- public transport, but if we did, it would be the best public transport in the world. Yeah. And then came up with all these absolutely shit ideas for how we'd make buses better, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> including a scale electric track that right. descended from the ceiling. And it wasn't scale electric, it was smaller scale. It was about the size of a sheet of A4, and it was all bits rubbish. of string. <laughs> Just came down. And there was, it became known as the unfunny bus. Yeah. And even when we were moving it around, as we yeah, had to do so, every week, yeah. oh, okay, because someone just shift the unfunny bus. And James May, because uh, it was James and Richard on the shoe, uh, he came up with a song. <laughs> get on board, get on board. I think he imagined lots of harmonies and things, yeah. but I can't remember how the lyrics were. Get on board the unfunny bus. Get on board the unfunny bus. Those buses da, are da, great, da, though. Da, da, so we, yeah. we, we did the bus racing at Lydon Hill. Yes. And they were really hard to tip over. We did um, people carrier racing, which was the first one of those. And I remember putting a crash cam on the front of Matt Neal's people carrier. I said, and I said to Matt, look, give it a couple of laps and then just smash someone so the camera will break, it's fine, it goes to a recorder. Yeah, fine. Got in it, went to the grid, smashed into the guy in front of me because it was Anthony <laughs> Reid <laughs> on and, and basically wanted to go <laughs> behind you. Yeah. It's like, oh, well, you just smashed the camera before we even start. Yeah. It's, it's like, that's... That was like that with the car football because <clears throat> yes. Russ Swift, the precision driver, was in the mix. And he was, you know, he was like, right, this guy is the best in the world for handbrake turns mm-hmm. and precision driving, all these things. And we did Giant Ball, which was one yes. of those mad ideas. Because I originally suggested we did something with David Beckham or someone mm-hmm. to try and beat, do a corner kick, yeah. use the car to hit, the, go- hit yeah. the ball into the goal. Then you came up with car football. Well, car football, you, yeah, it kind of came from... They had some cars that they were willing to for us to use. I think there was a manufacturer yeah, involved. Yeah, 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 yeah. We've got these pre-production igos, and they're going to have yeah. to be scrapped or something. Yeah. So you so can yeah. have you them should to do scrap. what you want. But we yeah. put the football field up, and then I had to put. I was like the referee, so I put. The, so basically, it's in. If you watch it, it's there. I'm putting the ball in front, and then I just had to peg it oh off six, and then I had radios to all the cars, and I had to like be the referee. So, it's really, it was brilliant though, it worked really well. Well it was ironic because the touring, you would think the touring car and the racing people would be the worst, but it was Russ Swift. Like James Bryce I think directed it and he was really strict and he said listen this is how it's going to work and he's like, oh, he, he, sounded, he was working for Ridley Scott and he sounded a bit like Ridley Scott yeah. and we thought oh it's like the headmaster. So you, you guys keep it on the down, you know, keep it down low as the shoot progresses we will become more physical but it was really clear like the yeah. boundaries were set, no yeah. contact. And um, so I was like, I managed to get the ball and then just got thundered into, got T-boned. Yes. I looked across and I could just see Russ Swift with this really angry glare. <laughs> and I thought, this is the precision man. And yes, just actually, <laughs> there was no, yeah, no yeah. quarter given at all. All right, so that wasn't a waste of money. What, guests, we should talk, we did talk about a few guests, but mm. best guest. Ooh. Ooh. So in, um, we just talked about, we talked about Terry Wogan, and that was yeah. amazing. For me, that was amazing. It was often the people that are childhood heroes yeah. and, and perhaps not with us anymore. So obviously, so Didn't Terry Wogan, was he wouldn't, he held out and he wouldn't do it for ages. Yes. And then finally, I think we upped the sort of yeah. meagre amount that we yeah. gave celebs yeah. to come on if they weren't plugging something. But and he gave it to children in need. Yeah. Oh, yeah, so, yeah, so, you know, yeah, he was the mark of a man he, he straight away. Great. He just basically rinsed us for more money so he could give it to charity, which yeah, is like fair play. Fair yeah. enough, yeah. And my other standout guest uh, was Roger, Roger Daltrey from The Who, yeah. only because it gave me a story that I've been dining out on for years. I found myself, after he'd been on the track, urinating next to The Who's Roger Daltrey. And so I, was, I engaged in small talk and uh, I, uh, I said, oh, h- how do you think you did out there? Do you think you did, did a decent time? And he just looked at me and went, couldn't give a fuck, mate. Life I've had. I was like, absolutely. 
Absolutely. <laughs> that is the perfect that response. Puts things in perspective. Rock and yeah. roll superstar. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah. It's not Shea Stadium, yeah, is yeah, it? Yeah. Wild man. All right, so that's best guests. Worst guests? Well, what? in the very early days, one of the first guests we had was um, Vinnie Jones. Who was oh, I missed a, Vinnie. A little surly, I would say. And Pe Perry uh, did uh, that. He, yeah, yeah, that was I think Perry. he got on very well. He yeah. was very well, good. Well, Perry gets Perry, on with yeah, He's such a great guy. Yeah, yeah, great guy. Good driver as well. Mm. Um, so, yeah, the, he came into our, the original porter cabin that was the production office at the, at the airfield, which was tiny and terrible. Really? There was this little cupboard was the celebrity green room. <laughs> yes. And it was, I mean, it was quite insultingly bad. But we'd had what, Harry Enfield in yeah. there and JK and they hadn't really made a fuss. And Vinnie Jones stuck his head into it and went, I'm not staying in this piss hole. <laughs> and uh, one of the researchers had to take him to the pub down the road for yeah. lunch. Good on him. And have yeah. a slightly <laughs> awkward yeah. lunch. So yeah. he was definitely one of the more sort of surly ones. Okay. But I mean, you know, as you'd expect really, if he was all sort of flowers and sunshine, yeah. he'd be like, what's wrong with Vinnie? So yeah. yeah. Um, who was, I don't remember, most people were really pleased yeah, to be there. really good and it was often people who go, oh, are they going to be, and they were fine. And because they were a bit nervous, yeah. they were fine. The only one, I, the, the only, if I had to choose worst or only because it was a bad experience was uh, David Walliams. Mm. You were there for that one mm. where he nearly killed us all. Did he? So he just ran, for some reason he ran really wide. Like, on the last corner, well, it's not for some reason, it's for a very clear yeah. reason. He didn't do he enough had, steering. Yeah, he, didn't he had put, mixed up the pedals. Yeah, no. he, he turned the steering yeah. wheel loads. The, the car was understeer, the front had lost its grip. Mm. And he turned the steering wheel over, yeah. and, instead, and instead of actually reaching for the brake, his foot was jammed into yeah. the throttle. So he was accelerating, yeah. wanting to brake, and his eyes had opened yeah. up like saucers. Yeah. Yeah. And I was trying to offer helpful advice whilst jogging backwards to lift off that. the throttle. Get we off, were, off, off. What was jogging the, that was funny because I do God. remember that. We were all running for it and I was really concerned about the sound man because it was in the days when they were still attached by yeah. it. Yeah, yeah. And he tripped and we were almost like pulling him like a toddler in reins because it, it was coming. And I just remember you running backwards going, <laughs> <laughs> get off the wheel, get off the wheel. <laughs> You yeah. were just, yeah, you did all these like, mm, and we were like, ah, ha, ha, this is awful. This hasn't happened before. Well, it's and good so, you had the uh, presence yeah. of mind to try and mm. deal with the situation yeah. while running Felt for your life. slightly responsible having taught this man, yeah. taught him to drive. Mm. Yeah. But that would have was, yeah. like the Perry's watch, obviously. Well, he's so yeah. good, Perry, isn't he? Mm. Stephen Fry was really nice, as you'd yeah. hope. And again, hung oh, and around. Richard yeah. Whitely. Richard Whitely, yeah. Richard Whitely yeah. was a nice man. Hung around for lunch. We had a chat with him. Yeah. Very nice. Tom yeah, Cruise. Yeah. Tom Cruise also. Yeah. He was actually very good. I thought yeah. he was awesome. wasn't he? I can't yeah. Yeah. She was faster in the wet, though. Mm. Was she? Yep. Yeah. And um, they both lapped in the, in the rain, and understandably, he came back for a second bite. Yeah. Yes. And yeah, literally yeah. drove the wheel. Oh, it it mattered so much to him, yeah. I think. Yeah. Because he actually. But he was genuine. Show. I remember thinking, he's genuinely, he knows what he's doing. So mm. that was encouraging. The only man I know who would feather the throttle while the car is tipping over. Mm. <laughs> It's pretty, pretty brave chap. <laughs> mm. All right, so I've got one more here. Um, now, since you wrote them, it's difficult to say, but favourite some say line, and are no. any of them true? No. I rewatched. Somebody has comped together all of the some say introductions on YouTube, so you can just watch them back to back, which I did, knowing I was coming here to do this, and I thought I'm you just going to remind myself of them. And I have to say, they didn't hold up as well as I'd hoped. So some of them I just went, oh, OK. The ones, it was always a thing. So what used to happen is that we would, on a Tuesday, we'd all meet in the office, me and the presenters, and we would go through the studio script. And I'd have written a draft of it. And that would include what I used to call the grouting, you know, like between the tiles, you've got to do the grouting, which was all sort of like kind of housekeeping, things that need to be there. So a menu for the top of the show, an intro for the stick, an intro for the guest. Uh, whatever else, just need, every week needed those things. And I would put in my sort of best shot and hope when the presenter sat down and Jeremy would sit at the computer with the script on the screen and I would watch him read it when he gets like the Stig intro. If he went, ha, huh, I'd be like, I've got awesome. him. Or yeah. sometimes he'd even he'd turn around and go, that's, that's very good. Goodness. And I'd be like, oh. and then sometimes he'd go, hmm, I'm not sure about this one. And then we'd go through the thing. And then it would become a group effort. And James never quite got the hang of it, I think. He'd always get a bit too long. And he would go, what about some say, when he first read Pythagoras' theorem? He'd like, no, James, it's yeah. too, that's already too wordy. It's a paragraph. So we'd sort of, we'd try and do these things. I liked the ones that were sort of 
just really silly mm -hmm. and also kind of stuck in their own kind of internal logic loop like yeah. Some say he keeps a photo of his wallet in his wallet. <laughs> or he has a tattoo of his own face on his face. Because they're quite yeah. good to deliver as well, I think. I mean, you'd have to ask Jeremy about this, but I think they're quite good because you do that. You've got the pause there. You can go, yeah. some say he keeps a photograph of his wallet in his wallet. So it's a good Clarkson delivery. Um, there's one actually that made me laugh and I could have completely forgotten it. I suspect Hammond came up with this himself because he did, he rarely did them, but mm. one he did, he went, so, some say something, something bollocks. And then, then the second one he went, and that I haven't done one of these for ages and I forgot to think of a second thing, which <laughs> it seemed on this, when I was watching yeah. it back, got a really big laugh, which yeah. is good. It's the way he delivered it, it was yeah. just perfect. Um, so yeah, my favourite would be something like keeps a photo of his wallet in his wallet, just because it's stupid. I like that my favourite is because it was based on fact. Mm. We went to uh, the Isle of Man and we spotted you waving at seals. <laughs> oh yes. <laughs> uh, and we, I just remember watching you waving at seals and it made it, and some say that he waves at seals. Yeah, yeah. I also think some of them because were just Because it was based jokes. upon, yeah. Oh, that's what, actually, no, I'm, sorry, I'm just picking my own jokes, which is it's terribly egotistical. I think my favorite though is, some say he knows two facts about ducks and both duck of them are good. wrong. <laughs> I don't know. It, you, yeah. I wanted those ones which uh, sometimes we'd argue ages about them, because, but I really liked it where it just painted a little bit of extra detail in this weird man's weird life. And it's like, the, it's, what, there's this idea that he's wandering around confidently stating two facts about ducks and they're both whilst bullshit. Waving at whilst yeah. waving at seals. <laughs> well, why do you, you and Jeremy hate racing drivers? <laughs> <laughs> because it comes out in your writing. We, I don't out. know. Yeah. I mean, I'm probably just Doesn't jealous. Doesn't deny it. So I knew it. I knew I, that no, that no, no, no. I don't hate racing drivers. You do, though. Oh, you do. Not you all of you. Do. I'm sure. Whoa. I can I, tell. That's a bit of nerve, isn't it? Come on. Come on. Well, because I remember this. But it was, this was the whole basis of the stick. And I remember Jeremy saying this, and I think he said this in the studio. He did say it in the studio intro to the very first show when we introduced the stick. He, he said, racing drivers' opinions are meaningless. They just drone on about tyres. They're, they're brilliant in the car and extremely tedious out of them. And then I wrote him a gag that was, we call this Mansell syndrome. <laughs> and that was how we got into the stick in the first place. It was always just like, don't speak. Your talent is to drive, so that's all you will do. Yeah. For the record, when I went for, I didn't really have an interview for, for, for the new format of Top Gear because I already knew Jeremy and Andy and they wanted to hire me because they'd seen my website, Sniff Petrol, and they liked that tone, that kind of angle of trying to take the piss out of cars and not treat them too sort of reverentially. But I went in for a chat with them and they said, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to do a car show, but it's going to be based in a studio. And I went, oh, I don't think that'll work. And they went, no, no, it'll be fine, I'll see them. And then we're going to have a, you know, have a test track outside. We're going to have a racing driver who never speaks. And I was like, oh no, that's not a good idea at all. So it shows how much I know, because basically the major format points of the show I thought were bollocks, but they yeah. actually worked quite well. Well, Jeremy was very clear that I was an idiot and didn't know anything, but he wanted my opinion of each car I drove. <laughs> I was going to say, that's gonna say not he does, no, he you, does yeah. that to everyone, yeah. it's fine. So I, did, yeah. did, I did used to love our chats. All right, back to the FAQs. So did a um, car manufacturer ever refuse to give you a car? Um, yes. So as far as I can remember, there's two. Okay. So first one is Bristol Cars. Oh, yes. Bristol uh, never really lent out cars anyway, but I think we decided to have another go. They, they, uh, well, they did. Did. Because I remember trying to get a Bristol when I worked on old Top Gear as a researcher, and I got put through to Tony Crook, the man who owned Bristol, because I think there was only two people worked there, him and a receptionist. And, and, uh, and he was a very well-spoken man, and he came on the phone, he said, oh, you're from Top Gear? Your magazine described one of my cars as donkey shit. <laughs> I mean, that's just ridiculous, isn't it? Imagine a car made of donkey shit. <laughs> the smell alone would be unimaginable. <laughs> and I realised he was just toying with me. He was yeah. never going to lend us a car. Yeah. And that was back in, you know, when, when it was, I think we wanted to do something with, uh, with Quentin Wilson on them. And then, yeah, so then we tried yeah, again yeah, in, yeah, the, in yeah. the new era. And no, same, no, 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 no dice. Joy. The, the best one is the City Rover where what happened was, obviously Rover knew it was shit, and so just kept going, oh no, they're all out. I remember calling, and it was like calling the press office and going, it's a really important car, we've done it in the news, we wanna, well, no, no, it's happening. <laughs> they're all out, it's all very popular, they're all out. So we ended up doing a covert shoot of the City Rover, 
So James went with a hidden camera into a deep In a really shoot. horrible tie. Yeah, really, yeah. Which I think in he was a bit distraught. The people would think he actually dressed like tie with a camera in I it. I need to watch this. And it's I, great. I, yeah, it was what's brilliant. telling about it is yeah. this was early days because James couldn't walk into a car dealer now and go, hello, I'm a normal person and would like to buy this yeah. car. Because they'd go, no, you're not. You're James May off yeah, Top Gear. Yeah, Whereas yeah. then... It was yeah. probably the, his first series? Or? First or second, yeah. And then, so, so what was brilliant was, so we did this whole thing where we set up, so we knew he'd go on this little route round the car dealer, because I think the director had gone in and gone, can I test drive it? And yeah. wrecked the roads. So he knew that it would go like, there was a little bit on the A3 or something. So I was in the slip road in the Fiat Panda, which was like its rival. So when I saw it go through and we had the radio, so he's left the thing, is da, da 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 And so I had to drive and get up alongside the, the, the city rover so James would go, oh, look, it's the new <laughs> Fiat Panda, the latest, you know, this is the opposition to this car. And I just remember James going, don't look at me because I'll start laughing. <laughs> and I was like, so I went up alongside, I thought, like this. And I, because I didn't want to look at him to make him laugh, it was kind of like quite difficult to keep level with him. It was like before, pro, we just, so that's how well, we used to do, us researchers used to do a lot of the driving on mm. the other bits and bobs. And um, yeah, I just remember it being brilliant. And, and also, because it was like as live, and we had people in vans and things like that, when he got back and said, it had finished. So we'd shot this whole VT in a oh, morning. Yeah. So usually, as you know, it takes all bloody day and you're like, oh, it's going to get dark, it's going to keep going, keep going. We were done by lunchtime. We had a nice sit-down lunch. <laughs> I just, which never used to never happen happens. on shoots. Never um, happens. Okay, so one, one that I do get asked a lot. Did we fake the races? Right. No. So well, you, gonna, were on, yeah, you were actually so, on them, weren't you? So um, I did the first one, which was the Aston Martin versus the train. I rewatched the end of that recently because I, my memory was that Jeremy was quite drunk Jeremy at the end, and he was. He yeah, watched was the a closing piece to camera. It's on YouTube. It's a, YouTube. Great car. It's a proper, <laughs> spectacular yeah. Aston yeah. Martin. Yeah. He's got a glass of wine yeah, in his hand. To be fair, that was a long day, mm. and uh, we got so I set it. I set it up so basically I based. So what I used to do was timetable the train, so you know, you know roughly, you know, so the connections mm. are there, and then. I'd then do the maths on an average speed of 55 to 60 miles an hour, which was still quite tasty if you think about it, but it was certainly on that one, it was a lot of motorway. Mm. And so I based it upon that. And the first one wasn't that close, but we made it look closer through mm, editing. It was, it However- was, Jeremy was able to get very drunk and yeah, waiting exactly, for the other two. Yeah, he was waiting for the other two to arrive, where he, he, he meant much quicker than I thought down the motorway did a did but that a was the key wasn't it back timing <laughs> exactly so um but the second one was je which is the verbier trip which I, which i remember being on the tube listening to two guys and that's when i knew the show was big i got on the central line as i always did across to white city where we where the office was and i remember two guys going did you watch that last night on a monday morning and they were going oh that verbier thing that was unbelievable i'm like oh okay yeah. we're in the public consciousness now so but that was really close to the point where I had to give Jeremy a pep talk from the office on the phone because he was like, I'm not going to win this. I'm like, no, no, no. <laughs> going to be are, all right, champ. You yeah. are. You just got to hit the, hit the average the speed, plan. right? Yeah. So the average speed is that. And, and then I had the director going, we're not going to win. We're not, not going. No, no. You are. Stop worrying about it and do the average speed, right? And that, and that, that whole business where they got there together is absolutely genuine. And, um, the problem was that was so perfect yeah. and people started going, well, they're just faking these, yeah. aren't they? And yeah. it's a bit like... But it's the level of prep you put into it. Yeah. So so you so basically much. created it the was, ingredients it was, for them yeah, to it make it work. Mm. It was a timetabling nightmare. And then, because you start kind of... Because you're knackered, mm. as I said earlier, you always start going, oh, God, have I worked that out right? And then when the man from the television shouts at you down the phone, you're going to go... I'm kind of lying and saying you're going to be absolutely fine because I don't know this for 100%, but... I know that that's what you need to hear. And then you go back and you do it and you're like, I think it's going to be there. And it worked out. Well, There's yeah. two things worth saying as well, because people used to go, well, they're obviously fakes. How are you getting all those shots of the car driving past the camera? And it's like, well, as you know, yeah. drive it back, turn Actually, it around and drive it back <laughs> yeah. the same route and just get, you know, the director yeah. would spend a couple of days getting yeah. those shots. Yeah. And it's also worth saying that, you know, even in something like a Veyron, 
Jeremy couldn't drive at 200 miles an hour the whole way because the Range Rover tracking car couldn't do 200 miles an hour. So it would be a tracking yeah, car, wouldn't yeah, it? But yeah, then all of, of the drive-by yeah. shots would be yeah. done later. Thank God. Otherwise, I wouldn't have got to drive across Europe in a Bugatti Veyron yeah. with a five mm. kilogram pot of Nutella. I remember and that. You're very proud of that. Your you? Nutella. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've got a picture of you somewhere in like a French motorway service yes, area with, with just, that pot of Nutella going. Uh, yeah. Like a baby. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. It was, that was amazing because wherever we went, even when it was, there was no people at all, we parked that, stopped that car for two minutes, there'd be a crowd of 15 people mm. staring at it. It was like a UFO. It was yeah. pretty amazing. Yeah. But I mean, it's, it's inter there's a lot of people that, s that missed the show, the original, the original. So where now can we find you guys? Because I mean, you've morphed on. I mean, you, when you're not doing impersonations of Stephen Merchant, you're also working on another car show, aren't you? Uh, am I? Oh, well, I'm st I still do bits and pieces for the Grand Tour, but you know, it's just there's not a lot to do. I just go so into the office. You're still at it with the boys. Yeah, but it's like we go in the office. I, I did it recently. We just, we just go in, and you know, we're thinking of doing something, and then it's like, well, what cars should we use? And, you know, and I'm still a car nerd, so I'll kind of chuck in my ten penneth, and then you know, you sort of, well, we need a gag idea here, and I'll still try and come up with gags and things like that. So, so I do that. Uh, I have a podcast as well, Ben. I don't know if I mentioned it. Sniff and Smith. Sniff I hear Smith it's and very Smith. good. I've never seen it, but I hear it's yeah. very good. <laughs> it's as good very as popular. my book, which you've also not read. Um, it's Yes, we are Britain's number one car podcast. Quite That's often, awesome. Whoa. Unless that pesky man off Top Gear has got his podcast out, and we, we sort of vie for the number one spot. But yeah, so I'm doing that with my friend Johnny Smith. Fantastic. And, uh, and then just writing things for people. Great books. Thanks, this, ben. this is proper memory lane. I mean, I, I really enjoyed this second time round, and um, it's a cracker. And you, you're still back into you're doing I'm car years. Yeah, the car years were on ITV4, which both of you are in it's as true. judges, yep. mm. two presenters champion a car from a certain year, and you and other people choose a winner. I like to think it's the thinking person's car show now. Mm. Uh, so that's the car years. It's on ITVX at the minute, actually. Oh. The car years. It's called the car years. Alexa, play car <laughs> years. <laughs> Jim Wiseman, one yeah. of the OG yeah. Top Gear boys, yeah. making yeah. new content. bringing a bit of magic. Mm. So really, everybody has found their feet in a different world. So the Top Gear DNA is spread far and wide, doesn't it? Yeah, and I think it's quite telling because TV is a quite a fickle business and people move on from shows you know, quite quickly, don't they, I think, generally? Mm. It's because you want to build up a good CV, so you'll do a series of, of something and then move on to something else. And I always remember talking to like, mates in TV and, and they'd go, so what are you up to now? I'm still on Top Gear. Like, You're still on Top Gear? Mm. Like, you know, eight years in. It's mm. like TV years are like dog years. That's like, why are you, you doing You were 15 that? years. Well, yeah. Life But it's because, I think, and you came back, didn't you? I went, points, I went so. away and then came back and then I came back again. I, yeah. So When's the statute of limitations on your stories from that no period? I have no idea. I have no idea, but there's an good. absolute cracker, which... Um, that, yeah, I'll, we'll come back to part two. We'll get back to that. Mm. <laughs> but I was going to say, I think it's amazing that, well, it's not amazing, but it probably says something about the show that for all the tiredness and things like that, that it was a hell of a job and that people who worked on the show tended to stick around a long time because it was hard to think of something you'd rather do. Yeah, especially if you're into, I mean, yeah. I was an F1 nerd, so I went, I, I've done F1, uh, but even people in F1 are like, oh, he's Talk about the Top, Top Gear. Gear guy, yeah. so we'll listen to him. Yeah. So that, and that's that's a <clears throat> that's a really great thing when you're talking to F1 drivers. I, uh, I wrote a guy. Yeah. I, I wrote. I met a guy uh, who writes like top line drama shows, you know, real prestige stuff. And you know, I wanted to talk to him. Like, you know, how does how does he construct the story? What's his process? He wouldn't let me ask questions. He kept going, and how, do, you know, when you were doing those jokes for the news section, how would those be? And I was like, oh, how, why is it? And he was a very brainy guy. He's like, I can't believe that he ever watched Top Gear, yeah. but he was fascinated but by he it. it. Kind of went. It's really interesting. <coughs> yeah. There's it's a same. lot of bright people that made the show work from top down, wasn't it? Wilman, Clarkson, you guys, and that's the, that's the, the unsung I, heroes. Well, I, I just think that it was a lot of right people at the right time, and I think, mm. uh, and also I, I, I still think the fact that we were there just before social media, again, yeah. having been there for the next iteration where social media was fully switched on and it mm. was just pages of bile, um, I think, the, as I said, the first, the first series wasn't brilliant and I think, and that was felt like a big relaunch at that point because mm. there was the show before that which was brilliant, you yeah. know, let's not take anything away from the Pebble Mill show because it was brilliant. And so, um, 
it, yeah, I think that we got lucky, right place, right time, right people. Mm. Perfect storm. Yeah. There's so many things that happened that, you know, I mean, I remember, you know, we were working on that show, weren't we, planning it before mm. the first series, assuming it was just going to go out on a Thursday night, yep. where it always had yep. been. Yep. And then the beer came to us and went, it's going to be Sunday evening. And we were like, oh, oh, no, God's yeah. sake. Yeah. Sunday evening's like just songs of praise yeah, yeah, and then yeah. period dramas, yeah. and it's so boring. Yeah. But actually, I don't perfect. know who came up with that idea, but it was perfect. genius because suddenly we were a programme for people who didn't find anything else they wanted to watch on Sunday night, which was, it turned out, quite a lot of people. So that was great. We filled that void. Now Sunday night's quite a big night for telly, but, you know, the Strictly final, the results are on and all that mm. stuff. But at the time, it was a bit of a wasteland if you didn't like, you know, Nick Berry pretending to be a policeman in the 50s. I think we should stage a comeback. Well, it's too late now, isn't it? And the other thing yeah. was, like, the, in, the invention of YouTube came along just the right time that people started clipping out bits of Top Gear and putting them on YouTube illegally, but it meant that people in places where Top Gear wasn't shown suddenly went, what the hell is yeah. this show? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then broadcasters around the world started cottoning onto that and going, we should buy it. And that led to this, what was it, 350 million global audience, whatever. Yeah. That, um, which I forgot, I was doing a job for, with some people recently and there was uh, there's some Americans there and uh, there's an American actor and, uh, who was in quite a big show for a while. And, and one, of the, one of the crew, just she overheard us talking and uh, about figures and she went what's, what's got that figures and I was like I was just a show I used to work on and this guy said to her Richard used to work on the biggest TV show in the world and she went what I think it was because like what this fuck wit used to work but, <laughs> but I kind of and I went oh I don't think it was the biggest show in the world and he was like no I'm pretty sure it was and, and, and it's like how quickly you forget yeah, I'm, because it happened I, yeah. so slowly and so sort of yeah. naturally, yeah. and then suddenly it was like, oh, and nothing changed in the way we made the mm. show, really, except we maybe got uh, but a bit the, more the impact. Yeah, it's the impact which I've never experienced since. It's the, uh, like, but now I've got there's people who I'm working with. I've just worked with someone who's kind of in his early thirties, and he, I was telling him a couple of stories, and he's like, oh, "Don't spoil my childhood." And you're like, "Oh my god!" And, and you forget now that all the people who were at school. Mm. are all in the workplace and and that's their childhood and then there's a, like you jump on youtube and then suddenly there was some guy who took a transit to the to the nurburgring oh. and I, and and because he wanted to he wanted to do that and, mm. I, and i was like oh i drove the transit to the nurburgring for the actual shoot and there's this kind of this weird kind of moments in your own life career mm. where people that you can share with it, what it turns out is literally anyone, which is nuts. Yeah. It's really nuts. Yeah, we've been in everyone's living rooms for 15 years. Mm. It's a no yeah, thing. it's an um, odd thing. And we're very lucky to have done it because, you know, lots of shows don't quite get that traction for whatever yeah. reason. And so it's nice that people yeah. cared and still seem to care a little bit about it. You know, I think some of it I would not do again <laughs> the same yeah. way, but there's some bits yeah. I'm quite proud yeah, yeah. of that yeah. we did some good stuff. So. Boys, thank you for coming on. I could listen to your stories all day. And um, if you've enjoyed it, leave some comments. Um, but you two, yeah, thank you for coming on. Thanks for having uh, us. Next time, maybe we get you on track. Do something a bit different. You and Smithers, I think you need some, you need some punishment. And actually, you've never been on track either at high <laughs> speed. So never. I have been on the track with you, though, a few times. Because there was once where we were going around the track, and I think it was like a Polo GCI, so it mm. wasn't something mega fast, but I just remember that you went, that's where I crashed the Koenigsegg as we're going through, and I was like, put both your hands on the fucking wheel, Ben, please. It, it remains on my bucket list to take you particularly, and Clarkson actually, in a fast car, and, and have, properly have you on those Jesus handles, praying for mercy. So, <laughs> another time, another day. Richard Porter, Jim Wiseman, legends, thank you. Thank you. Thanks. <laughs>